How did an acclaimed punk rock musician start one of the most innovative and talked about small presses on the planet? And how did he manage to take a book whose title can't even be set on television and turn it into one of the biggest runaway bestsellers in years? You're about to find out. From the edges of publishing, it's Disruptor, celebrating the rebels, mavericks and weirdos of the publishing industry and encouraging each of you to disrupt in your own way. Now here's your host, John Bard. Greetings one and all, I'm John Bard and this is Disruptor, episode one, featuring Johnny Temple of Akashic Books. I've been in the publishing world for close to 30 years, and I've seen a lot of things change, but maybe they haven't changed fast enough. And so I asked the question, are there disruptors out there? Are there people and companies that are really changing things in publishing, pushing us into the future, throwing out the old rule book and creating a new one all their own? I went in search of that, and I found them. And every week here on Disruptor, you'll meet them. Welcome to the journey. It's time to disrupt. Today's episode of Disruptor is brought to you by Writing Blueprints, the breakthrough step-by-step system for writers that creates truly great books. To learn more about the most disruptive way ever to become a successful author, visit writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10% off everything on the site. The writing world has been shaken. Meet the earthquake. Go to writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10%. Writing Blueprints. This is how you write a book. Johnny Temple had already conquered the world of punk rock with his acclaimed band Girls Against Boys when he turned his attention to publishing. He founded Akashic Books in 1997, seeking to redefine how a small press chooses its titles, promotes its authors, and serves its readers. Akashic's author roster reads like a who's who in cool, Featuring, among others, Dennis Cooper, Ron Kovich, Melvin Van Peebles, Lydia Lunch, Richard Hell, Lawrence Block, and Elizabeth Nunez. Temple's punk DIY ethos has led to a catalog of wildly eclectic, always fascinating works, presenting viewpoints often unheard elsewhere. In 2011, Johnny published a racy children's book parody, not because he thought it would sell, but because it made him laugh. Within months, Adam Mansbach's Go the F to Sleep, that's not really the title, but hey, this is a PG-13 podcast, was number one on Amazon. Proof that a little disruption can sometimes yield a huge payoff. I spoke with Johnny from Akashic's headquarters, a converted can factory in the heart of Brooklyn, New York. Well, thank you, Johnny Temple, for joining us on Disruptor. It is, uh, it's an honor. I'm a fan and I've been a fan for a while of your music and your your publishing. Let me begin by asking the question we always like to ask here on Disruptor. We are here to celebrate the rebels, the mavericks, and the weirdos of the publishing world. Which one of those words best fits you and why? Weirdo, weirdo disguised as a rebel. I just, I've always felt very weird, very strange, very oddball. And I mean, I think that most people are weirdos. You know, I think it sort of comes with the skin. I always try to tell my, I have have two children and I try to tell them that it's not just okay to be weird, but I would never want them not to be weird. Definitely have a rebellious spirit, but the rebelliousness is not simply like a political or a social justice rebelliousness. It's also a, an aesthetic rebelliousness. Um, So, and it's one of the things I feel about Akashic is that I, part of the reason I would, would want to avoid having to become a nonprofit, which we, we've been able to avoid doing that, is because while there's you know radical elements, social justice elements that run throughout most of the work that we do, it's important for us to be able to also just publish really strange, strange books that maybe don't have any apparent social merit to them. Your phrase that you use for Akashic is reverse gentrifying the literary world. What does that mean? First of all, the expression is a bit tongue in cheek. It's not meant to take itself too seriously. You know, publishing is based here in New York City. And I think it's a fairly elitist uh, profession, both in its outlook, but also in its makeup. 
it's most people in publishing are very well educated. I think that there's a snobbery towards less educated people uh, that exists in the publishing world. A lot of people try to cover it up through their political liberalism, but I think this elitism still sort of ekes out. And I also think that, for example, people in publishing complain a lot about how uh, there's fewer readers, it's hard to find readers, you know, what's happening to our values as a, as a society. Um, and I don't feel, I'm not nervous about readers going away or about people losing their desire for stories. I think that the publishing business needs to do a better job of publishing books targeted, not just to the very well educated, but you know what, even as the publishing people in the publishing business are complaining about how hard it is to sell books and how people don't read as much, they're also ignoring like vast slices of the population whole demographics uh, and so I think that it's that the burden is on the publishing business to make what we do more relevant to the wider society and I think sort of de-gentrifying the publishing world is a good place to start. In addition to running Akashic, I'm also one of the co-founders and main organizers of the Brooklyn Book Festival and I love um, book festivals because to me they are part of that um, reverse gentrification process that needs to happen. At, at a public book festival, people can come from all walks of life and find something for them at a well-run, truly public book festival. Um, and so they're sort of demystifying of the book. This is all informed by the fact that, you know, I have a music background. And so music connects with people so much more, uh, more directly and more easily. And uh, books sort of become this remote and elite form of culture. And music doesn't have that. You know, I think people all over the world from the bottom of the socioeconomic spectrum to the top of it, pretty much everybody loves music um, with a few exceptions. And I, I wish that, you know, my goal is to help be a part of trying to give books that same kind of cultural cachet have people realize that books are maybe not as easy to appreciate as music, and they simply aren't, but um, to close the gap a little bit. I, I want to dig in a little bit later into the, these niches that you're, you're covering, and, and because there's some really exciting and interesting things you're doing, your new imprint on grief, for example. Uh, again, that's the sort of disruptive stuff that I think is really fascinating, and, and giving people books and ideas that that aren't really being presented um but first let's just get this out of the way because probably the disruption that you're best known for and i don't want to spend a lot of time on it but is what if if i mention akashic or i try to describe akashic to somebody else and i say oh yeah they're the, they're the folks that gave us go the f to sleep which is the pg version of it because the pg podcast that's the one that rings the bell so let's just spend a minute on how go the f to sleep happened yeah so I was, um, I'm friends with the author, Adam Mansback. Um, I'm friends with him through the publishing world. Uh, and he had, the first time we collaborated together was when he wrote a story in 2004 for our collection, Brooklyn Noir, which was an anthology of stories based in Brooklyn. And he wrote an incredible story called Crown Heist. A little while later, he came to me with this proposal for this book, Go the F to Sleep, which was the idea was a sort of a fake children's book, a book that looks like a children's book, but it's for parents. And it's not, not a book for kids. Some people think it's a kid's book. It's not a kid's book. It's a parent's book. And it's kind of the uncensored parental frustration monologue. I think part of the reason why he sent it to me is because he knew I was a parent. And... Um, so I might respond to the, to the subject matter and which I did, you know, and, and, um, we decided to take a risk and publish the book. The risk being we sort of specialize in literary fiction. That's kind of the main thing we do, though our list is very eclectic and we do a lot more than just literary fiction. Uh, we, we were doing very few like full color books at that time, which are more, um, expensive to produce, even though Go the F to Sleep is a small book. It is full color. And these days we do a lot of full color books, 
when I say full color, I mean full color on the inside pages. Our, our book covers have always been full color. Months before publication, word spread about that book, and it became this overnight sensation six months before it was even supposed to be published. You know, the world changed for Akashic and for Adam, and we sold millions of copies, and it's been a very enjoyable process. Adam's a great guy, and it has really stabilized the company. Why do you think that book in particular resonated and disrupted the way it did? You know, one of the things, and it's a, that it was sort of disruptive about the book, is that it had almost nothing to do with us as the publisher. We, the thing that we did right was to recognize a book that had some potential and to sign it up. You know, when Adam brought it brought it to us, but it was really uh, the parents of the world not just in America or English language, but it was really the parents of the world that made the book a success. Our marketing of the book was not that responsible for a lot of the success because the success preceded our marketing. And so it was this really organic groundswell among parents who loved this idea, go the F to sleep, something you wouldn't say to your kid, but that you would think to yourself, perhaps on a nightly basis, one of the great things about that book was when it would get criticized by, say, a close-minded Christian group. I'm not trying to criticize all Christians because most people who were Christian didn't have any problem with the book. They liked the book just as much as everyone else. But there were a couple of sort of reactionary Christian groups that took offense to the book. But we never had to defend the book because anytime there was an ounce of criticism against it, there was like a mob of online parents from all around the world, including a lot of grandparents who got very vocal defending the book. So it had, it had like this massive street team behind it. Uh, and it, and it continues to have that, you know, parents feel it was one of the things about this book that some people who aren't parents don't fully grasp, which is that while it is a humor book, it's not just like a, a humor book as in something you chuckle at. It's like a full body from the bottom of the toes to the top of the head, full body laugh, mm -hmm. because this issue of sleeplessness is one of the central psychological challenges for many, many parents. So it's not simply light humor. It's not actually light humor. Um, it's something that, that people, people feel, feel very passionate about. So we were, pretty thrilled that we never even had to defend the book against any attacks on it, that, that there was just swarms of people ready to do that work for us. L let's yeah. talk about something near and dear to both our hearts, and that's punk rock. You great. are uh, in the band Girls Against Boys, great band. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a subject for another day. <laughs> but uh, I know that in, in one, of the, one of the things about your past that interested me particularly was that you were on Discord Records. I consider Ian MacKay to be just one of the great disruptors of the last 50 years. Ian MacKay is, is a minor threat. Fugazi owns Discord Records. Talk about what you learned from him. Yeah, I, Ian has been a very uh, important person in my life. And I'm really fortunate to say that he continues to be someone who I engage with in my life as a book publisher. And Discord Records has always been very inspirational to me. And I would, in fact, say that for Akashic Books, that in, when I started the company, Discord was probably the core inspiration um, and, and, and continues to be. That's one of the things that interested me is when I look at Discord and I look at Mackay, there's an uncompromising attitude behind it. There, there is, he, he had something in mind. He had certain parameters, and he lived inside it, and he lived it. And the bands that were on Discord lived it. And when I look at Akashic, it reminds me of, of a record label like Discord, but also, oh, I'm thinking like when I was a kid, anything that came out on Sire Records, I knew I was going to like, right? I mean, right? So that's not something you see in publishing, and you don't see it really anymore in music, where you can just look at a brand. You can look at a label or an imprint and say, there's a really good chance I'm going to like everything that comes out from that place because I appreciate the aesthetic behind it. 
in publishing now, you're seeing just, you know, with all the mergers and kind of big mega companies, much like music, it's just lost. It's just a brand name on, on the side of a book. Akashic, though, seems to be living that, and it seems to be working for you. I, I mean, thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you know, it's an interesting... For me, it wouldn't be any other way than us having an identity. You know, we're not just making books. We're, I, I feel like there's an artistic imperative that I feel for running a, a publishing company that is basically the same thing that I felt playing bass guitar in bands, which is trying to use your influences, you know, whatever has influenced you, and then trying to discover your own voice. And if you're just doing something that someone else is doing, you're not really adding not really adding to the landscape and so i i don't want akashic to be redundant with other book publishing companies i want it, i want us to occupy our own unique space and i will say that when we started publishing books in 1997 there were very few uh book publishing companies that seemed to have that sort of strong a strong sort of rebellious type of identity but these days i actually see it all over the place I think there's a lot of great book publishers that are really doing their own thing and doing it in ways that are, you know, either radical or anti-establishment. But one of the things that I really like about Discord, and I also saw this with Touch and Go Records in Chicago, which uh, my band Girls Against Boys, we put out records on Touch and Go. One of the things that was most inspirational to me about those labels was that they weren't operating against, you know, the big record companies. They weren't, def they didn't define themselves in opposition to anything. They were just doing their own thing, you know, making their own road by walking it. And that's, that's a little bit how I see Akashic. When I, when I started Akashic, I didn't have any background in book publishing, but I wasn't scared to just jump in and figure it out as I went along. And while there's a lot of things about the corporate publishing world that I may disagree with, you know, or wish were different, we're not, we're not here to be against them. We're just doing our own thing on our own time at our own schedule. And that's what, you know, that was one of the sort of key lessons I learned from from Discord um, was that they, you know, Ian and Jeff at Discord, they didn't really care what Warner Brothers or Atlantic was doing. They weren't, they weren't sitting there scowling at those big companies. They just didn't care about their, those companies and they paid them no mind at all. Only, you know, the only mind they paid them was there were some great records being put out by Atlantic and Warner Brothers and Polygram and all those big companies. And so, they would listen to the great musicians that, that those record companies put out. But beyond that, they weren't like studying their techniques or, you know, looking to put, even poke them in the eye. They were just, just doing their own thing, making their own media, making their own music. And, and that's, I think, what, you know, what we're trying to do at Akashi. Are you thinking when you, when you look at uh, considering books for Akashi and you're looking at new imprints, are you thinking primarily about, well, how do we inform and entertain the group of people who would naturally be attracted to us? Or how do we create things that get out into the wild a little bit and maybe change some people's minds? More the latter, because our, our, we've now published, you know, 400 books. And while there is a sensibility that runs through our books, the list is truly eclectic. And so... We have books where we maybe sold 5,000 copies of one book and we sold 5,000 copies of another book and there's no two people that own those two books. Hmm. Uh, so there is not like a core Akashic audience. There, I mean, there's, a, there's probably a core group of people that are really following what Akashic is doing and what we stand for. But at the end of the day, we're really just trying to sell our books to as many people as we can, and it, our, our audience, the audiences who buy our books encompass all sorts of different types of, of people um, and who have very different interests. You know, the, 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 the person who buys a, a book that we publish, 
punk rock photos from Washington, D.C., might not be so interested in the debut novel by the Haitian female author. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so we're just trying to sort of get our books out into the world, and we're not, um, we're not overly conscious of trying to have a unified audience behind us. Along those lines, I noticed you have just some really interesting imprints. The, the New Grief imprint that you're starting, uh, Punk Planet um, imprint, which is a magazine whose loss I still mourn, um, and, and a bunch of other really interesting uh, niches. When you do that, is it part of a, an overall plan uh, to say, here's where we want to go? Or is it just, do you have the ability to say, hey, no, that's really interesting. No one's, no one's doing that. Let's do that. Yeah, it's sort of no one's that sounds really interesting. No one's doing that. Let's do that is is kind of the MO. And for us, the imprints serve to uh, expand what we do. We I learned early on in, in, in terms of disrupting our own list. Um, I, after we had published maybe 30 books or maybe 40 books, you know, and, and having thought of ourselves as being, for lack of a better word, a sort of cutting, a, a company with cutting edge sensibilities. It's a cliche, but I'll just use it because it's, it's useful shorthand. Um, but if you keep doing the same kind of things, books over again, over and over again, that edge gets dull. So there's, and going back to this idea of an artistic imperative, you know, we want our edge to be sharp. We want to be, we want to be forceful in what we do. And so I kind of realized early on that we needed to um, rejuvenate our, our list. Uh, reinvent is too strong a word because it's not, we're not trying to like, it wasn't like we're trying to overhaul what we were doing, but we needed to disrupt what we were doing it, for the sake of, you know, literary, aesthetic, artistic growth. Now, we're a small company, so our edit, my editorial team is me and three other people. We have our tastes, and it's really hard. We have the opportunity to publish a lot of books, so it's really hard to um, keep your tastes, to rejuvenate your own tastes. You know, and there's only so many hours in the day, and our a lot of our own reading time is taken up with Akashic. So hosting imprints is a way for us to expand our editorial scope and bring in other people's tastes and not at all randomly people who are like-minded like-minded people we had a um, prodigy the rapper from the group mob deep he he passed away last year which was tragic but for several years he ran an imprint and for us infamous books you know, it's, it's the idea is that there are going to be an imprint is going to be bringing in books that fit the spirit of what we do, mm -hmm. but that are books that we on our own are probably not going to identify as books that we should be doing. For those writers who are listening, who might want to work with Akashic, give them just a few words of advice. Uh, how, what's the best way? Do you, do you take unagented submissions? Do, do. What's the best way for people to reach you? We, the best place, the best way to reach us is to email me or someone else on my editorial staff and just send a query letter. Uh, if you know someone in our orbit, uh, a recommendation, like if, if someone who I know and respect sends me an email saying, Johnny, I just read this great manuscript by this unpublished author. And I really think you should look at it. I think it'd be a great fit for Akashic. That's going to carry some weight and that's going to make us pay attention more. Um, that's now that's a, that advice is not altogether useful because not everybody knows someone in our orbit. But when I say in our orbit, it could be an author we've published. There's many authors that we don't publish, but who I know who I'm close to. And then there's other people in the music world who I know. So, that's kind of a shortcut to not just Akashic, but to submitting to any publishing company is to try to find someone close to someone and have them put in a good word for you. But otherwise, it's just a matter of sending us a, a query letter. Don't make it too long. Don't attach the manuscript. Uh, don't send us the actual manuscript until we've asked for it. Uh, 
And before submitting something to us, go to our website and try to get a sense of our list to make sure that it's actually a good fit. Tell me a disruptor in history or perhaps someone who's alive today that you really connect with. Who's your favorite disruptor? My favorite disruptor is probably Martin Luther King, um, who's way more, was, was made way more disruptive than history, than American history has tried to make. People that, you know, have not read that much about the civil rights struggle in the 1950s and 60s don't realize that how incredibly crafty Martin Luther King was. So many of the protests were geared towards TV sets, you know, the, the Selma March, and a, and, a, and a bunch of his other marches that he organized were intended to disrupt social change in America without African Americans getting hosed, getting assaulted and attacked with hoses. And what's interesting what you're talking about there is that sometimes disruption on a large scale only happens when people are shocked into understanding. Things can go on for a long time, but there's that tipping point when people are shocked, when people say, oh my goodness, that's really happening. And I, and I, I agree, I think that with, with Martin Luther King, there's certainly an aspect of that. Yeah, and as far as what's happening today, it probably is not something you like to think about with the word disruption, but Donald Trump is a great, dis not a great as in good, is horrible, I hate Donald Trump, but uh, the, 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 some of the standards ta ta standard tactics of disruption Right. He's doing a very effective job of disrupting the disruptors. Let's, um, uh, let's end on a, on a hopeful note. For those, <laughs> people, who, <laughs> those people who are listening uh, who want to disrupt, in whatever field they're in, whatever they're doing, what is your advice to them? What, one, in, one piece of advice is that I think that organic disruption is the best kind of disruption. Uh, uh, although I'm not sure if I thought about that a little bit more, I might disagree with myself. Hmm. But I do think that that when people are making art, whether it's literature or music, that the way they're going to succeed as an artist is by doing what they do best and not, and not worrying about trends and not trying to play other people's games. And I think that that's the same with sort of disruption. I think... It's your one's going to be most effective disrupting in a way that's truly organic to you and um, isn't sort of an artificial concept from the outside that you're trying to pursue. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for that great advice. Thank you for the great music. Thank you for the great books. And thank you for joining us on Disruptor. Thank you, Thanks Johnny. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Today's episode of Disruptor was brought to you by Writing Blueprints, the breakthrough step-by-step -step system for writers that creates truly great books. To learn more about the most disruptive way ever to become a successful author, visit writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10% off everything on the site. The writing world has been shaken. Meet the earthquake. Go to writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10%. Writing Blueprints. This is how you write a book. For show notes and videos, go to disruptcast.online. And to start a disruption of your own, visit writingblueprints.com to discover the most innovative and coolest way ever to write a great book. We'll be back next week. Until then, go forth and disrupt.